Now open your eyes. So in the last three weeks we covered a wide range of subjects and one of the subjects we didn't uh, go into detail is, is um, death and dying and after death. But there's a, a point in that particular Buddhist teachings that is relevant 
to the, to the final stages of this series, which is the path to liberation. And if you have any questions at any time, please ask. And it's our lifespan. So the length of our lifespan, any lifespan, is determined by our, the karma for that particular lifespan. So we may have 20, 40, 60, 80 years. No one knows except um, the, uh, the, the, the conditions that we carry. So once it's exhausted, that, that this, the consciousness leaves the body and your death occurs. However, it is possible to add to your lifespan by practicing a number of, of uh, we're called long life yoga practices. But how that happens is that in a stream of lifetimes, you may have had a lifespan many, many times of just say 60 years, but something happened and that person, I'll just say your, your past life, passed away at 40. So somewhere along the line, you've got 20 years of, of years of human life in your store capacity. So what happens is you carry that extra lifespan with you and through the long life practices that we do, like dedicating merit and in previous meditations, we, we imagine that we're purified then we access those years and when we say, when we admit to having, to say, committed to all sorts of things in past lives and we acknowledge that and then the meditation start to purify our being, we add to that. We don't know or how much we add to it, but we can add five, sometimes ten years to that to our current lifespan. A highly realized Lama will have a direct knowledge of the capacity, your capacity, our capacity to generate additional time in this lifetime. It's an incredibly, incredibly subtle form of teaching and knowledge. So that does help. The factors affecting what we do in terms of karma is factors affecting the quality of our life in this current life is that we have a thing called merit and merit is accumulated by doing virtuous actions and we have a stream of good merit from past lives that come into this present life here. In previous classes we went through how incredibly fortunate we are to have a precious human rebirth and the chances of that ever happening again and just acknowledging what you've done as human beings in past lives, the, the virtue that you've practiced, the things that you haven't practiced that have brought you into this human, precious human rebirth. So we've got a thing called merit that, and it comes directly from positive states of mind. So the more you generate positive states of mind in this lifetime, the more you add to the merit. Having joy is something that is helps if you do a job that you really love to do and create joy, then that's something that adds to a positive state of mind. Sometimes if you don't you can't do the, the job that you love, and this is a direct quote from the Peaceful Warrior, will find the love in what you do. So find some, some value that will give you that joy to get up and, and complete that work or that task that you're doing. So the loss of power of a life force can also happen for incorrect eating or incorrect medicine and also incorrect behaviour, which is reckless things like driving too fast, probably... Uh, mountaineering or climbing mountains in the worst possible condition and also erratic behavior like not following a routine so routine that really does sustain life in terms of positive states of mind there's also the opposite to that where people have lost their joy in their lives and they could have lived longer for to say from 10, 15, 20 years longer, but because they've lost their joy in life, they lose their power, the life power, and 
mental afflictions is, is one aspect of that, where people just give up. And at the hospital once, I met this gentleman who was recently diagnosed with an incurable disease. And uh, we get called to attend, just to interact with, with patients who've just received bad news and don't have family support, especially during visitor restrictions. And this particular person stood out so, so clearly before I even came close to him. He'd already checked out. There was something about him that his, his, his spirit had gone. And it was the was out of it was clearly something that was that was that it, you'd picked up. Anyone would pick that up because he was just a body. He was just a form. And even in his conversations, he was not engaging. He he'd or it was the clearest example of somebody who didn't want to face reality and had gone somewhere, which in most cases is, is follows a trauma, and he received that trauma as well. So it does happen. Sometimes you see patients who who have got an option of treatment and that they can add another 10 years to their life, but because of the shock of being diagnosed with a particular illness that was so contrary to their lifestyle, like somebody in the armed forces that were, you know, the loved by women, uh, venerated by a lot of his colleagues and a really good track record of, of his military history and not being able to do those things anymore. The only thing that he had left was that identity of being this person. And when it was no longer going to be there, he died within 48 hours. And it's, it's such a quick thing that, that the, the life force can go and it can go with the willing, the, the, the mind and people just letting go of this life. It's a, I wouldn't have thought that, but when you see it up close and personal, it's something that, that kind of stays in your mind. So there's other parts about the human psychology that, that um, becomes really clear in Tibetan Buddhism. But before that... On the path to liberation, the object of, of abandonment is our cyclical existence, our connection to being part of this samsara. And how that happens is that our aggregates, which we'll be talking about, our perceptions, the way we look at things, how we react, our labelling, um, our thoughts, are all contaminated because we do not know the true nature of reality or the majority population don't understand the, the connection between cause and effect. So somebody who may cause a lot of harm to, to humans will think, well, that's just my job, that's the way I am, but cannot see that in future that particular karma will ripen and whatever action they're doing right now, even criticising people, it will come back to them. We don't know when it could become the next life or it, or can actually result in 100 years' time. But every action, every action creates an imprint on our consciousness. And once it does, when it meets the right conditions in the future, it will ripen. They're saying that a, a monk called his fellow monks monkeys. It just it literally wasn't a fun thing. It was a legitimate criticism calling them monkeys. And he was reborn as a monkey for a number of years. So it's really, really careful what we say when we criticise people or we don't like a particular group. Or Most Buddhists, really genuinely practising Buddhists, won't engage in that type of rhetoric. They might, they might joke about it and so forth, but they won't criticise. 2005 years worth of study prior to that as well in the Brahma and Indra, but it, then it was produced. So it's understanding that this has come about not by itself, but by causes and conditions that brought about that. Like my, any human being 
does not exist independently. They weren't born in a cabbage patch, so to speak. They were they have a connection to their parents, their genetical connections, and their genetical connection to their parents have it to their parents and so forth. Their personality to a certain degree is already set. Then you have what's called the rate of reaction, and you, everything else in your environment can teach you to behave a different way. You can learn your intelligence is one level, but you can amplify and enhance your intelligence and move forward. So there's nothing about us that, that's solid and concrete. That's what we're trying to do when we're on the path to liberation. And we're also trying to, we're committed to cl uh, clearing our five aggregates. So whatever we see, we have a clear understanding of the objects that we see. Whatever we hear, we have a clear understanding of what we hear. Whatever we say, we have a clear understanding of what we're saying and the impact that it has on others as well. So the five aggregates are, is consciousness like a bare awareness? So let's look at the mind for a little bit. Consciousness, if you look at like an umbrella, consciousness is that bare awareness. So I'm at the moment, I'm looking at this room, I can see just my bare awareness, I'm not labelling anything. And all the mental factors are, are within that consciousness. And these are, we're going to go through and look at this, this session. So all these mental factors are going on in here. We're, we're feeling things, we're having sensations, we're labelling about recognition and we've got things like conditioned response to certain things. And it's those mental factors, they're not, in, they're not permanent because the consciousness is the true nature of reality. It's in accord with reality. All those little mental factors within the consciousness are not in accord with reality, which is a clear, clear and spacious and aware mind. And they're the bits that we are attempting to purify on the path to liberation. And they're the bits that can be changed. They're the bits that actually we use to understand the path to liberation. So there is reason for everything. So in the Buddhist in the Buddhist uh, teaching, there's a really clearly well defined explanation of the human being through psychology, physiology, and also the the mind itself. And we're going the thing which really does help to understand how we learn and you can see some of these models used at school and universities and even in business we have all these things called the five basic wisdoms and the five basic wisdoms are first of all is a basic mirror-like wisdom we see a reflection of the larger picture and we do that naturally and without knowing when we're driving is a perfect example. We're just seeing the big picture. Everything's reflected in the big picture and our consciousness is, we're at an, at an unconscious competence where we're driving, we've learnt the skill and now we have the big picture and the awareness. Then we have a wisdom of analysis, which is within that big picture, you identify with particular details. So we're down to the details. So in the spare awareness, I see chairs. And because of my previous conditioning, I know they're red chairs. I see people with different colour jumpers. I can, with my peripheral vision, I can see movement. I feel the temperature in this room. And I'm seeing mo moving objects in this. So, and I can, I can zone in and write down to that blue, is that water container? and to those white shoes and so forth. And when necessary, you can drill right into a particular detail. This is, this is a very common meditation that we do as well, because if you look at anything that you do, it's, it's just bringing, a, bringing in an awareness of what you're currently doing now. And that awareness, once it's in the picture of your mind, you can work with it. So the next basic wisdom is the wisdom of equality, which is empathy. And it looks at things not as different, but sameness. And this is, again, a very such an important teaching in Buddhism, 
the teaching of equality, that we're all the same. So how it would work if you're watching the 2016 uh, old sort of series of the closing ceremony in the Olympic Games, you would have noticed that there are approximately 11,000 athletes that were there that were coming into the arena and that had all their flags. So you would see this big picture of of people, these athletes coming into the arena at the, at the end of the 2016 Olympic Games and be picking out all the things about, he comes from France, there was, I think there was a 207 nations and you'd be, because the television would, or the video would home in on it, you'd pick from various countries. But what the wisdom of equality says is that they're all human. So instead of seeing man, woman, uh, binary, what, or child, or, or even uh, might have pets, they're all sentient beings. So this is the strength of Tibetan Buddhism, or to just generally Buddha, Buddhism, because it does not seek to find differences, it seeks to find sameness, that we're all the same. And in that sameness is a thing called our Buddha potential. And we all are connected via our Buddha potential. The potential to be beyond what, what is currently constricted by our thinking, our minds and our bodies. Our consciousness is not just limited to the brain or the, the heart or within our own body. It is far greater than what we can possibly imagine. And to me, this is the lifeblood of the Buddhist teachings in the sense where it can significantly change your mind in the way that we interact with people and not see the differences but see the sameness. What will result in liberation is understanding the true nature of reality and having a subtle perception on what shunya is, which is emptiness, which is not part of these teachings, but it is it's almost uh, a shift in the way that you see things. And some people will, will think that emptiness means voidness, but it certainly is not voidness. People who have attained it and have had the skills to write about it say it's a sense of fullness where you are connected in some degree with everyone. If you still can't hear me, should I shout louder? No, should I okay. shout? Okay. Sorry, everyone. This is like a, a booming mic. This is a uh, at a sports show. Did you see that kick there? Did you see that man there? Whoa! And the kick got into the into the um, a goal for the Carlton Carlton Collingwood match. Do you know who won? Yesterday, last night, it was a big, big thing anyhow. So thanks, Money. I know this is um, always a bit hard. So even with people who have got the committed the most heinous crimes, our teacher once said to us when we found out that uh, Hassan Hussein's brother was, was killed, that if you, for a one moment, think good, I'm glad, then you're... Uh, a group of nuns and, and even monks that go to prisons that, that engage with prisoners who have committed heinous crimes and also sex offenders, and they work with them, not to put them down, but to give them a hope that, that things can be different. And they do make a difference. There was a wonderful story of a story of a, of a prisoner in America who was about to be crimes that resulted in that. But he wrote a letter on the day that he was executed to the nuns that who, who helped him, and he died peacefully. That's a very important bit in, in uh, the Buddhist teachings, is to the importance of dying with a very peaceful mind. So the nuns of liberation. The second thing is skilling up to make a change. Either you say thing, either you know how to react with that person and don't agree to things that they're asking you, 
or you simply just have a little bit of space between you and that person there so you can focus again on skilling up. And this leads us to the 12 links. But there's also quite the wisdom of achieving activities, just finishing off the five wisdoms. So you have a, an understanding of the, the difference and the connections between things and actions, where you know that baking a cake, for example, will drink well, mixing eggs with flour will, will make a cake. So there's a wisdom of knowing precisely. It's almost like beyond an engineer is, gen, engineer's mind, where you know that if you do this, this will happen. If I do that, this will happen. But in context to the Buddhist teachings, it's this lifetime, that lifetime. This will happen, that will happen. I have this happiness because of that in that lifetime. So everything is interconnected. And this leads us to the 12 dependent, dependent links looking at the time we've got a bit more time to do it and this is an incredibly fascinating teaching and model buddhist model in the sense where it is the closest thing to date that that um, presents us with a model of past lives present and the potential for future lives and it includes ignorance at the very start, which we'll focus on a bit later. The second is consciousness, compositional actions, things like name and form, and it continues on to grasping, craving, feelings and so forth, how we're actually created. So we'll, this is where you buckle up and uh, you just sit with it, like we're saying, past classes. If something doesn't make sense, fine. Just sit with it or you may put it, just put it aside for the time being. But overall, I have the confidence in your overall wisdom of the big picture that you'll start to pick up certain points as well. So the 12 dependent links you may have seen for those online, this is, this is where the picture of, this is called exactly the cycle of life, the 12 dependent links you'll see in some Buddhist temples, particularly you'll see them in the temples from the Foundation for the Preservation of Mahayana Teachings, all those temples through Lama, Lama Zopa, etc. And the, pen, the, the 12 dependent links is the path to liberation when you're raveling. So we are all raveled and this is like unraveling a ball of, of wool that's become all tangled. Or for those that like the garden work, it's like a hose where it's all tangled up and it's about untangling it all of how we are as a human being that gives us the potential to really uh, attain liberation. First of all, the first, 12, uh, first link is ignorance, which is the ignorance not understanding the connection between cause and effect, our actions and the, and the result of those actions but also confusion as to the reality of things. And reality of things that everything that appears within our lives, and this is a very general sense, is our karmic appearance. Things that we've done in past lives are now coming up in its appearance. Just sit with that if you, if you wish and we could dedicate hours and hours to this. I certainly am not qualified, but there are teachings that, was, that, that go on for, for weeks on shunya, which is emptiness. But always is saying, sit with the fact that everything that appears to our consciousness is a result of all the past actions from past lives coming into one. So the second link is, comp is our actions. So because we don't know the true nature of our reality, we think that we're independent, we are inherently existence. I am I, I have done all this, like the, one of the stories that we have, the rich man who, who was such a pain, he hurt so many people in acquiring his wealth and fortune that he thought he was a self-made millionaire and they're writing books about him and he had the gift 
and he was the one that brought his family's business and he brought it and he and he made it profitable he's worth billions of dollars he did it all he is the one who did it he's the one who and he claimed the the all the credit to himself and he would sign autographs because of people who wanted to be rich and famous like him well the reality is that he's being rich and wealthy is a result of all the generosity that he's actually shown in past lives that have come into this life here. So it's not without a cause. It's not him knowing when to when to invest and how to how to handle your taxes and so forth. It's about generosity. But because this rich and wealthy man is so mean and is not even donating any money to any charities. He's not filling in the piggy bank of the merit and the karma that goes with that wealth and richness. So what he's doing is he's causing those actions for a future life to be born as a beggar. But because he, he also harmed others, it may be that he's born a beggar with leprosy. So they're the conditions that we don't know. So because of the action that we create a cause and on our in our consciousness take me as an example i spent a lot of half of my life in ignorance and not knowing i had a bit of an idea between cause and effect karma i thought that karma was just for this lifetime but a lot of what i did was was trying to emulate a a, a wonderful spiritual path but i was Still not, I was not purifying, and I certainly was creating more karma, and and thought of of myself as inherently existing. So all those actions are now imprinted on my consciousness. Because I've come into the Buddhist path, I'm doing a lot of purification, a lot of it. But I've got like eons and eons of past life where I've I've been that way. So I'm carrying this heavy backpack of past karma that will ripen in a future life if I don't start working very hard in purifying it. So already right now, with whatever I've done, whatever I said, and all, it, and all my actions, there are imprints in my consciousness. So now this is the interesting bit. So already my future life has been established already so in the future who i will be where i will be the shape and size of me and what realm i'll be born in already the imprint the cause the result is already there so do i know what that will be no absolutely do i know uh how possibly to stop it if I'm going to go down? Yes, I do. And that's continuously practicing, purifying, creating a lot of non a lot of virtue, not involved in non-virtue, and generating as much knowledge as I can, the true nature of reality, not seeing myself as dependently uh, as existing on my own that I've created myself that I I see everyone as independently existent inherently existent trying to clear that away from my mind to see everything that is an image of my karma and to develop as much as I can bodhicitta because bodhicitta is the fuel in our in our hearts our our help our assistance to liberation so that's a very significant thing which is uh, sort of like interesting to to really meditate on and understand it, it's not something that you can be easily convinced when you first hear it but when you spend time on it it kind of starts to make sense along with the links of all other buddhist teachings on its own, it doesn't make sense. And if you tell somebody, they'll just may, may walk away. So we've got that happening. So that if you imagine a baby in a womb, 
then at the moment they don't have their six sex sense objects, which are basically what we went in meditation, which is the the sight, what we see, what we hear, what we taste, our body tangible objects and phenomena that we see. So it's already kind of set in there happening um, in the future of this little embryo in the womb. And that little baby will develop its six sense objects as it grows. Sometimes in the womb, it's already doing that. There were some um, people here who were either mothers of twins or grandmothers of twins, so they know that even twins in a womb already developing the tactile touches and because they're, fairly, they're developing it fairly quickly by having somebody punching them in the ribs or somebody on them and so forth. And it's also known that babies can hear the sounds, music, and a lot of pregnant mothers play gentle, soft music to help the, the babies in the womb. They even talk to them. So all those senses are developing whilst they're in the womb. So that's already set. So in the result of that second life, they'll develop the contact all their lifetime. And as a result of contact, they have feelings. So usually when we're contacting, like if we're having a, like this water here is a perfect example, sorry. If this was a cup of tea, I'd say my contact is, that's, I label as a cup of tea. I will have contact with the water, with a tea, sorry, it's not. And I will have a feeling about that. It's a nice cup of tea, it's not a nice cup of tea. If it's a really nice cup of tea, I will have a craving to have that tea again. And if I don't have it, I'll want to grasp at it. So I'll go to supermarkets and try and find the same tea or I'll stock my kitchen up with all the, this particular tea because I'm grasping at it. I'm doing the gentle side of, of this grasping. The usually grasping relates to um, two people that have a, an attraction to each other. And that's how it happens to some degree. But I'm just using with a cup of tea at the moment. So in, in that new child's life or that baby's life, they'll have feeling and they'll continue to grasp and they will continue to crave and they will continue to deteriorate and they will de uh, disintegrate as when the moment they're born, everything starts to age. They will age and they will die. But in this life, in continuing this particular life, knowing that I've already set the karma for my future life, I will need to look at how I'm craving, how I'm grasping at things. And grasping itself and things could be that somebody criticises you and you're grasping, you get at yourself and you have a reaction. And then in continuing in this by having con being nourished by craving and grasping and, and our feelings, we actually set the karma for a future life. So it's not certain that the karma that we've created to, to create a, a future life already, and this is, the, this is the thing that needs to be investigated as well. So we've set now the trend for a future life. And as we discussed in previous classes, we don't know when those karmas will ripen from future lives. So there's this, 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 thing, this cycle of existence. That's why the wheel is, is, is used in this symbol. We're constantly cycling, cycling and cycling and cycling and cycling. And everything that we do through karma and through action is produced, which means that anything that is produced goes through a process of disintegrating. The moment a baby's born, it starts to age. The moment a seed is planted in the soil, we're ageing. It's ageing. It will grow and then it grow to a tree and then the fruits will happen and then the, eventually the tree will die. 
So what the Buddha is saying that, that all products are impermanent, all contaminated things are miserable, all phenomena is selfless, and nirvana is peace. Okay, any questions at this time? This is um, sort of a bit of heavy subject, but it is all relevant. Um, any questions so far? No? All right. So going along in terms of the path to liberation, what we are doing here is, is purifying our aggregates. So we're no longer at, at the control of our ag aggregates. And completely eradicating the production of any new karma. We've still got the backlog of karma, but we're now preventing ourselves from creating any new karma. So eliminating any future new negative karma. So if we do achieve that level there, it's called liberation. The thing about liberation is, is pretty much you become an incredibly calm, peaceful person and you're happy because it means in future rebirths you will have higher rebirths and you can teach what you've learned to others. But just you on its own achieving liberation or nirvana, it comes to a point where one's happiness goes beyond themselves and they think, oh, what about everybody else? I've achieved such a high status, high level of my spiritual practice. What about everybody else? So we start to embrace other people within our line of sight. Think about how we can help them achieve liberation. And voila, bodhicitta now starts to come into your being. And it is the wisdom of equality. It's the wisdom to understand that what we do now what we do now, tomorrow, it can be made very, very purposeful even when you're doing things that you may not enjoy by thinking, well, every action that I'm doing now, I'm doing it with patience. Or if you have to go to the doctors. And it can be pretty scary. They say that by me visiting the doctors, may I develop further patience and understanding. And through that patience and understanding, <clears throat> may this give me the courage, <clears throat> my voice, the courage to practice bodhicitta. So that sort of helps you deal with that oneness, that particular isolation which says, you're doing this on your own. Now you realise that everything that you're doing, there's a lot more people out there than what you'd expect. And it gives people meaning and purpose in life. Sometimes when our life force diminishes, people, or when they're going through an extremely difficult time, people look for one thing that, that helps them particularly if they're going through a very deep depression or something, they're looking for one thing to keep them connected. During um, COVID, when patients were quite sick with COVID in, in isolation, they could not see their families. And their families are like lifeblood for them, even hearing their voices. And particularly the elderly, they were the ones most vulnerable, not because of the condition that was affecting them or any comorbidity, because they've lost their life link with meaning and purpose in their lives, their children, their grandchildren. And there was this incident, incidents once where this 
particular woman, at that stage with Delta, there was nobody was allowed to go into the COVID wards. So we were, we were calling patients in there. And this woman said, I can't see my family anymore. They're so far away. So her perceptions, her memory of them and her illness, and just the way that she was speaking, you could tell that life force was diminishing. So one of the mitigation strategies we have is to be quite wrathful and say, and what, what is said is probably not appropriate to say here, but it's to be extremely wrathful and get them to hang on, to hang on, to hang on all the time in a way that jolts them out of that sliding in, into diminished life capacity. So they're the things that are so in accord with the Buddhist teachings that it's just amazing when you look at the whole gambit of teachings about helping people, understanding how our lifespan can diminish very quickly by being of benefit to others, giving them, giving, not just making them live, uh, not, not that you would make them live, but you would actually help them to hold on enough to get out of the COVID ward to be already with patients um, and other people. Because it's pretty ugly in a COVID ward. With Omicron, we're allowed to go into, COVID, into the COVID wards. But even the fact that you put, put on all the PPE, people are not still every touch, every tangible object. Even when you're speaking, you have to really speak in a way that soft, gentle voice is not possible. The touch is not possible. Sometimes you have to wear face shields. So you find a way to connect with people with the tone of your voice and just your presence as well. So that's the, in the essence of the Buddhist teachings in part, that no matter what we appear, our form, our aggregates, there is this purity within us all to be able to connect with people, to be able to really find and use that purity to understand our nature of reality, to understand that we can be of benefit. We can be of benefit through bodhicitta, which is the purest mind attainable past liberation. So it's about time that we do a meditation. Thanks for your patience with a, very, with a subject that's not often widely talk about it in that it, detail. We're going to do a meditation now which encompasses a lot of those teachings in a way which incorporates the purification of our own being and our past lives. And it's an ancient Buddhist practice by Tsongkhapa. It's giving and taking. And past teachers here have said that this practice can change things within us. So sit comfortably now in a position where if you need to move, you can. Allow your body to relax. Keeping the body straight so the energy can flow beautifully through within your body. And if you're not well, you can do this lying on the floor.
So we're clearing the mind now. And we're clearing. Clearing with the breath. Clearing thoughts. Clearing objects. Clearing shape colors. And for a tiny moment, bring the mind to the breath. And if there are thoughts within your mind that are causing a distraction, you may wish to simply say, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. I'm breathing in and I'm breathing out. until every cell, every fiber, every muscle in your body is beginning to relax. From the forehead, no creases, Relaxing down to the facial muscles, the jaw relaxed, the back of the head relaxing, releasing any tension, the neck, the shoulders, down to the arms, left arm, right arm. Hands becoming soft, opened. The back relaxed. The chest and tummy down to the legs and knees. ankles and feet. Feel the energy moving down, clearing. Cleansing. Just be present with yourself at the moment or your consciousness. And breathing in, breathing out. And 
by bringing the mind to the breath, developing the skills of concentration. Keeping the mind on the breath. Imagine now light, a brilliant light within your heart. And the light can come from your preferred divine source. As Buddhists, we would believe it's our Buddha potential, our pure nature of mind. So now the focus of the mind is the brilliant white light within our heart, our heart chakra. And you sense and feel the warmth of this light expanding outward first within your body clearing and healing every cell a movement of light within the body an upward movement a downward movement Clearing, and your body is filled with light now. And the light is emanating from the light in your heart chakra. It is an indescribable light. No labeling. No sound. can't taste it. Can't grab it. Beyond human conception. Powerful, powerful light. And 
within you. Now that light grows at intensity and warmth. It starts to emanate out through the pores of your body. Like a sphere extending outward And it can extend out in lightning speed way beyond the world. But including every sentient being on this planet. And this indescribable light emanating from that one small, tiny part is beyond imagination, beyond conception. It is our consciousness that all sense of self dissolves into that purity That all knowledge is known in an instant, past, present, future, all merges into one. where all past karmas have been purified through regret so as far as your imagination can perceive we find a center And that light extends outward now to find every sentient being reaches out humans, non-humans the form realms, the formless realms desire realms And with the heart of Bodhicitta, 
of compassion, universal love and compassion. We take on board all the negative karmas that these sentient beings have ever, ever accumulated. Such is the expansiveness of our own mind to have the capacity to do this. We take it on board, breathe it in, into your heart chakra in the form of darkness and feel it now dissolve into the brilliance of your own awareness and then extend it out, replace the darkness with the light in every sentient being Some karmas are very strong, so we'll send out the precision of that light, the detail, right towards the hearts of every sentient being. And then breathe in, take in the remaining remnants of their karma. In the form of black, blackness, and in your light, the lightness purifies that karma, dissolves it, and then with the light, we return the light back to every sentient being. And as Buddhists, we see that in the future we shall all become Buddhas. So with a mind, aspiration, we imagine that every sentient being has now taken the form of a Buddha, but not in the shape and colour of absolute purity. And so that your light, the light possesses innate wisdom within you, is now conjoined with every sentient being. that there is no separation, no mark of demarcation between one and another. Our forms are bright light. Consciousness is pure. Every sound heard possibly now pure, like melodious sounds, no longer have the desire cravings gone Grasping is gone. All purified in our Buddha nature. It's 
So gently now, gently bring that visualization in an instant back within our heart. And we have the hope that all living beings have happiness and all causes of happiness, that all living beings be free from suffering and all causes of suffering, that all living beings never be separated from joy, that all living beings abide in equanimity, free of attachment to some and aversion to others. And may this practice, this generosity of time to think of others and self be the cause for all of us to attain enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. So that now ends the meditation. And when you're ready, you may gently open your eyes. This concludes term three. Term four will commence on the 13th of November. But does anyone have any questions at the moment? So we'll just wait for the online. Anyone might have a question there? There's tea and coffee down in the kitchen and so we will be exiting from this door here and um, enjoy a cuppa and a cup of tea. And once money gives me the go ahead to say no questions. No questions. Thank you everyone. It's been such an honour to be part of the teaching program. And I wish you well and happiness always. And everything that you so wish to achieve in this life, I, from, the, from my heart, hope you achieve. Take care. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. The enjoyment shop back there. <laughs> yeah, the shop that gets you created. Oh, what happened to YouTube? What do YouTube?